Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. That's me and you, Bruce. And for the faithful. That's everybody listening. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy, and we are in a fine mood tonight. <laughs> we're, I'm happy. I'm really happy, Bruce. That was that was the best. In some ways, it might have been the best offensive performance that I've ever seen from the Edmonton Oilers. And it wasn't like they scored the most goals, the most scoring chances, but the arrogance that they had when they were moving that puck around, especially on the power play, Bruce. That was right out of that was right out of 1984, 1985, uh, Edmonton Oilers. That kind of cockiness. I just, I, I was lapping it up. I loved it, Bruce. So, hell of a game. So this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. And because it was a very happy win for the Edmonton Oilers, we're going to do two good things each. So why don't we start, Bruce, with your first good thing? Well, I'm going to go right off the board, and I'm going to select uh, Connor McDavid <laughs> as my good thing number one. Uh-huh. Uh, Connor really had it going on tonight. Right, right from the very first shift, you could tell that he meant business. And you know, I, I'm getting a sense here, and watching him tonight, I, I, I'm, I'm saying to myself, you know, this is a man's game he's playing, and not, not to, he not to, it. not to say that he hasn't been a great player for a long time because obviously he has but I get the impression that he's now sort of fully developed as a physical specimen and an awesome one obviously with the speed and everything else but also the strength to win battles and and the determination and the resoluteness uh, that uh, uh, that he had tonight he wasn't going to be denied <clears throat> and he uh, he was the man. He took over that game right from the very beginning. His his line had an incredible shift of a well, one minute into the game, maybe. And they had, I mean, the first thing that happened was Tippett put Drysaddle out against Bo Horvat, who uh, Horvat had given the, the <clears throat> David line lots of trouble last night. So Tippett having home ice advantage, uh, last change advantage, he switched up. So he put Leon against Horvat, and that freed McDavid a little bit. And uh, his line just had it going on and they had a great shift i mean it seemed like 75 seconds it had to be at least 60 where they just vancouver just couldn't get it out couldn't get it out edmonton kept kept cycling it or winning the puck battles or even making the plays right at the blue line to keep it in keep it in keep it in and finally only when the edmonton guys were kind of out of gas from all of the exertion they'd put in at the very end of the shift did cassian take a take a run out and crunch with a clean check, Jake Burton. And I'm thinking, that's a nice way to start a game. <laughs> and it just got better. I mean, McDavid obviously connected for the uh, for the hat trick with uh, uh, a, a superb goal, uh, well, lightning quick goal with uh, 0.7 seconds left in the first period when they had two and a half seconds on the clock off the draw and uh, executed the play so cleanly they got two shots and a goal with 0.7 seconds to spare. Uh, that was the but, killer, eh, Bruce? That was, that, that's, mm-hmm. that's a killer play, right? When that happens yeah. to you? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack Michaels, who called this game tonight, he nailed that one when uh, Thatcher Demko froze the puck with two and a half <clears> seconds <throat> left in the first, and he said, well, that was kind of unnecessary. I thought he'd play the puck just to, just to wind those seconds off the clock, and normally you think, well, yeah, it's only two and a half seconds, right? Well... They only needed 1.8 of those seconds. But Bruce, anyway, uh, in, go ahead. Sorry. In the second uh, period, McDavid just raised it to another level and uh, scored a spectacular, what turned out to be the game winning goal on the, on the power play when uh, they did that patented thing. We didn't see much of it last night, but tonight we did of, of the zone entries on the power play where, they, where McDavid winds up where he's circling the net while the Oilers are crossing just about the center red line and they pull a long drop pass to him in full flight and then he hits the opposition blue line at warp speed and they just can't stop him and this play it was actually kind of funny Leon lobbed the back pass to McDavid and Barry thought it was for him and he tried to knock it down and he missed did you notice that 
Do you uh, think it was on purpose? Because on the one broadcast, I was listening to the Canucks broadcast for some reason uh, with John Garrett, and oh. they were speculating whether whether or not uh, Barry uh, missed it intentionally, was it as a decoy or not on purpose? Because they they thought it worked at really well as a decoy. Well, and I would maybe would they were have. onto something. I mean, he did swing at it and miss, and I, I I saw him the way he was laughing in the goal celebration was like he thought the pass was for him, but it turned out it wasn't, and it was an aerial pass. And, of course, by the time Barry mm -hmm. turned around, he, he got wind burns from McDavid blasting by him going in the other direction. And uh, he, he came in on the blue line, Alex Edler, 15-year experienced defenseman, and he did that old Gretzky hard stop that sent the snow flying into the into the, into the night like Jean-Claude Keeley on the, on the uh, giant solemn. And Grenoble uh, just cut inside and then wired a perfect shot far corner. It was just one of those McDavid, uh, not quite moment. I mean, it probably took him four seconds to go from one end to the other. <laughs> Holy moly. I mean, just an unstoppable play. It and reminded a, me too, Bruce, of skiing. That mm -hmm. that particular rush mm -hmm. seemed like a, it just, that's what was popped in my head as well. I was maybe thinking of Tomba or... I don't know, like Franz Clammer. Just, just that, just it. Just he seemed like he was going as fast Canucks. as a downhill racer. And I would also say, Bruce, I saw him do that move. I think last night as well. And I think is that a new move? Like, is that something? I I don't remember him as much because I I I think I saw it made him maybe try that move. Oh, I in the exhibition game that I watched where there was no. Um, well, there was no uh, sound on it. He was doing that move. And I thought, oh, that's new for McDavid. And now he did it in a game. And You're talking <laughs> he... about the, the right, the left move around the defense? Yeah, cutting in, no, cutting into the middle of the ice. That sharp right. cut into the middle of the ice. And yeah, no, the I shot. don't think it's totally new, but uh, it sure was nice to see. I mean, it's it's not, even if they see it coming, it's so hard to stop. I mean, Gretzky used to do this too in, in a, kind of a different way, but he would come up on the defense, to the defenseman's left and then he would slam on the brakes and he'd shift and the goalie would be looking around the defense from one way and then the shot would be coming from the other side and it would be past him, you know. And and uh, McDavid did it, but with uh, more power, I guess, even on the shot than, than Wayne used to get. Wayne Wayne used to wrong foot the goalies and, and uh, beat them that way a lot. But uh, anyway, it was uh, just a marvelous sort of get make you gasp, glorious play. Uh, and then, of course, he completed the hat trick on just by going hard to the net, taking an absolutely wonderful spinorama backhand pass from Leon Drysaddle in front of the net. And Demko did well to stop the first one, but uh, McDavid was not to be denied, jamming home the rebound. And had an assist to that, and absolutely phenomenal um, metrics in this game. Like the McDavid line utterly dominated play when he was out there. I mean, the shot attempts in his 16 minutes were 25 for the Oilers, 8 for the Canucks. Like, the puck was in Vancouver's end, and, and the McDavid line was just having their way. And his mates, I mean, obviously, Nugent Hopkins had a big game. Cassian was pretty good, but really, uh, McDavid was obviously the driver tonight for, for the entire team, really. Yeah, after getting shut out on the scoreboard, I think he was kind of determined and... Uh... <laughs> So Bruce, I had the I was thinking the exact same thing about McDavid. Like uh, you're talking about his uh, the strength, his strength mm -hmm. out there. I was thinking strength, it was yeah. more like it was also psychological mm -hmm. that Great. we're starting to see someone who's who's in this league. And you think he's like he's thinking, I'm not going to let any of these players push me around, boss me around. Like no one's going to Ryan Kessler or Ryan Getzlaff him anymore. Mm -hmm. He's gonna sure. he is going to take it to him. This is his league now. He's mm -hmm. the man, like, and he's going to own it. He's going to dominate this league, and he's not going to let anybody stop him or push him around or anything like that. So I, that's what I was thinking. And, and I was also thinking, and I don't know this the stats, are, are the Canadian division teams younger as well than the, like, are there Ooh. a lot of veteran players on the Canadian division teams? Because he actually might be older than 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 the median, right? He might, he might be, uh, possibly, uh, I don't think than the median, but no. I, 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 the median seems to run somewhere close to 27 for the whole league. And when it's different, yeah, it wouldn't it's be different that. by yeah, it wouldn't be that decimal different. places as opposed to integers. Fair enough. Yeah. So but it's, uh, the Canadian teams do tend to be younger cause they can't sign. Well, sometimes they can't sign free agents, but anyway, 
I, I was wondering about that. If we're going to see, a, maybe it's just the Vancouver team. It struck me as a kind of a, a younger team. But um, yeah, the Vancouver Stars tonight were definitely second best. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the list right now. And the only two guys on the team younger than McDavid are Pugliarvi and Yamamoto. Still on the Oilers. Mm-hmm. Right? Still. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Bruce, that's a segue to my uh, first of the two best things. That I thought um, we've been seeing a lot of Jesse Pugliarvi in, in Finland. He's been fairly consistent. That was the his first game with the Oilers. I thought was kind of iffy. Uh, some good, some bad, but I thought this game was, there was quite a bit of good and, and I really liked his hustle. Mm-hmm. And if he's going to make it as an NHLer, and based on tonight's play, like he can, this is what we saw in oh, Finland yeah. consistently, you know, two thirds of the game at least was this kind of player. He can really fly out there. He's really big and he can poke pucks, lose pop pucks for check. When he gets the puck, he can make some nice plays. I did like, like there was one play, I think it might've been in the first where he, took the puck over the blue line and cut a nothing play. And he beat the defenseman wide, just using his great reach and size. And he almost got off of, he almost had a little bit of a partial breakaway, which the defenseman um, averted a dangerous shot by getting his uh, stick on Pulley RV stick during the shot. But it was mm-hmm. just a very kind of yep, simple, nothing play that Pulley RV turned into something with his assets, which is his right. speed range and size. Uh, he made a beautiful pass from behind the net. I think it was to Turris, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Out the um, short side, the right right-handed stick with the he, he did it kind of behind the back, and he caught uh, Turris on the forehand. That was a, that was a beautiful play. Yeah, and he got his own uh, dangerous shot early in the second period on net. Turris set him up, and Archibald set him up. Oh, it was actually it was he set up uh, Archibald, did he not? That's who it was, wasn't it? It was an arch. Yeah, yeah, it was Turris passed it to him, I believe, and then Pulley, Pulley RV set it up. Archibald and Archibald. Oh, right, it was Archibald. Believe yeah. that he had not scored on that play. So um, I like the third line, Bruce. I think mm-hmm. the Oilers may have a third line. Uh, Turris can make a pass, take and make a pass, which is always at the NHL level, which is mm-hmm. which is a real skill, which is something that Riley Shane wasn't so good at. And Pugliarvi can, generally speaking, you know, he's a little iffy on his stick now and then. He can be give away the puck, but um, he can also make he can take and make a take and make a pass. And he really flies out there. He's 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 trying to get good speed on the ice and uh, being the kind of the driver, the dominator on his line, take the puck. And I liked what I saw. What about you? He likes to try stuff, doesn't he? And I mean, he does. That's... yeah, the confidence is back. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's certain things where you think the guy, you know. You got to fail a few times before you realize, yeah, that's that play might have worked in the World Junior, but it's not going to work in the NHL kind of thing. And I mean, obviously, he's not a newcomer to the NHL, but in, in a very real sense, he is he is a newcomer in that he hasn't played in this league for almost two calendar years, right? So I think his last game was in the middle of February of uh, 2019 before he had his hip surgery. And so here we are, you know, 23 months later, and he's finally back in the NHL. So he's still kind of rediscovering his way around, but he's doing it in a very positive uh, way where, you know, he's bringing his game and he's, you know, uh, he's not tentative at all out there. He's making stuff happen and occasionally mistakes, but uh, um, I'm seeing, or at least tonight, I saw much more, uh, like me, seven shots on net. Wow. Yeah, and he looked That's, good on the. Looked good on the power play in that brief little moment that he had out there. You know, screening the goalie. Big mm-hmm. guy to screen the goalie. And not a bad guy to think about having on the power play, uh, um, maybe. Um, you a couple know. hits, a takeaway. You know, yeah. that's, that's a nice night's work. What's your second good thing? Yeah, I'm going to go with Darnell Nurse tonight. Uh, he and his partner, uh, Ethan Bear, uh, they played a lot of their time with the McDavid line. So they benefited from that, but I think the unit benefited from the play of all, of all the players together. And uh, uh, it was very, very, this was an exceptionally wide open game for shots. Like, it's how often do you see both teams with 40 shots? But it was 46-40 for Edmonton. 
And during the 19 minutes and change that Darnell was on the ice, the Oilers had 23 shots on net to uh, 15 for Vancouver. So wide open, but the Oilers got the better on the scoreboard by three goals to zero. But for all of that action, what I liked about uh, Nurse's game tonight was his composure. I thought he was very good behind his own blue line. He had one turnover like in the first, seemed like five seconds of the first period. Uh, uh-oh. Uh, but he, uh, he, he settled down very nicely. And he wasn't like huge into the offense, but he wasn't giving away much either. What what'd you have him for uh, for scoring chances? Uh, he he right? was really quiet on the scoring chance mm-hmm. front. He did, didn't make a major contribution to any grade A chance of the fifteen mm-hmm. Oilers chances, which uh, there was oh. eleven of them at even strength. Mm-hmm. And he but he he only made the one mistake that turnover that you identified. Uh, I think it at the uh, two minutes into the game led to a right. grade A chance against, and that was. That was his only major. So if a defense was like zero and one um, mm-hmm. on the scoring chance uh, metric, that's pretty good. That's a damn good game, actually. Like that. That's very quiet game, but a good game. So I'll take that every time. And he had uh, uh, what did he have? Two shots on net, five hits, uh, a couple block shots, and and just uh, um, I, I I'm liking to think that we're seeing a little bit of a maturation in this game. And uh, that's uh, that's something the Oilers and Darnell personally really need, is for him to to uh, take his game up to the next level. I won't say he needs to start playing a man's game because he's been doing that for quite a long time already. But, yeah, uh, anyone who would fight Milan Lucic when he was <laughs> when he was like 21 or 22. Yeah, 20. 20. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that was his rookie season that he took on took on Lucic. He but. seems more assured with the puck, Bruce, to me. Like he seems like he's he's making better decisions. He's not rushing it as much. He's not skating with it right. as much, I'm finding. He's just moving it more. And playing just more of a settled game. I just and there was one play where I where, where I really liked his play. I think Bear early in the second, if I'm not mistaken, it pinched or turned over the puck and there was a two on one the other way. Right. And those guys were flying up the yeah, ice. They were and Darnell Nurse was skating towards his goalie with them and then he like at top speed, he did, did a pivot, mm-hmm. and the temptation of a of a younger defenseman would be to shade over to that shooter who who had a clear lane to the net and was cl- very dangerous. But Nurse played it like a veteran. In that situation, it's the guy who who's coming down the other wing who can get the one timer pass, the cross seam pass, who is a much danger more dangerous shooter. The goalie probably you know is you know not it's not a like the guy with the puck shooting down the wing it's it's not a 25 percent chance i don't think it might it, it can be sometimes but usually you can limit it to like a 15 percent chance let's say mm-hmm. but nurse stuck with that other guy stuck in the middle of the ice he blocked the passing lane and then at the last second he closed on the guy who was shooting it was a textbook play of a very fast two-on-one mm-hmm. at- attempt against the orders and, and i just thought he was exceptional on it i really loved his play on it yeah, a little play that caught my eye was one time when the Oilers had been pressed in their own zone for a significant length of time, which Vancouver is really good, by the way. They're, they're excellent at zone entries. they got a lot of skill, and, the, and they can keep the pressure on uh, for, you know, shifts at a time. And this is one where, you know, he was pretty deep in his shift at this point, I think, and his mates were too, and, they, you know, and they had, I think this was, uh, uh, I guess it was the... Uh, it wasn't the second period, so it wasn't a long change, but uh, they finally got control of the puck, the Oilers did, and somebody got it to Nurse at the bottom of his own face-off circle, and he saw this lane to freedom, and he put on the burners, as he can do. And I remember that. He, yeah. he, wheeled it out, he wheeled it out to center, and I, I thought, this is the time where you see the old Darnell is going to take it all the way up, <laughs> go all the way around the net, and then the puck's going to come back at the Oilers, and he's going to be in a bad spot, out of gas and behind the play. But no, he took it to the center red line, dumped it into the corner, made his change, you know, veteran play. And that's what we want to see more of from this player is what I want to see more of. And that was just one. It's just sort of almost routine hockey in a sense. But but uh, getting it out of the zone was a big thing, and he did it well. And then he, uh, uh, he got the puck deep, and the whole line was able to make the safe change. And... Yeah. Sometimes a little play like that is uh, is big in the context of the moment. 
Yeah, he and Barrett, they, they played like a top pairing defensive unit that game. That's And that's a pretty high compliment. Mm. My next uh, <laughs> good thing, Bruce, is the Oilers' power play. And uh, when I talk about the Oilers being arrogant in their puck movement, it was on that power play, Bruce. It was like, first it was, it, I had that, I had that feeling, and I remember this in the 1980s, of being at the rink and watching the games and sitting there and kind of almost pinching myself and thinking like, we are so lucky as fans of hockey to be able to watch this team in the 1980s. Like, we are so lucky to be sitting here watching this performance from these players. Like, who gets, which who which hockey fans get this? And we're getting it. This is something we have. And I had that same feeling tonight with the Oilers uh, when they were on that power play. Just the, just the, unbelievable uh, superlative skill, just otherworldly skill of those guys. And Bruce, last year we talked about how McDavid had improved on the power play because he, you know, before he was always on the left or the, uh, excuse me, the right half wall. And you always kind of knew what he was going to do. He wasn't going to shoot it. He was going to try to pass it. And it became so predictable. And the owner's power play was not very good in 27, 18 because of that. And, He's gradually learned to move. And last year, he was moving all over the place. He was here, there, and everywhere. Well, Bruce, this year, on this power play tonight, everybody, everybody was moving everywhere on that power play. They yeah. have become this group of players who are just going, going, going. And I don't know if it's the addition of Tyson Berry, because Oscar Clefbaum was a fairly static player. And I and I really liked that. And obviously that power play was hugely successful with him as this kind of static guy at the top, feeding it over to Nuge or feeding it over to McDavid. That really worked. This is something, this is a little more loosey-goosey and different and, and it's more like jazz than, a, you know, kind of a playing off the music sheet. They're just, they're improvising constantly, moving everywhere. And and it was almost like they were the heart, like another a comparison was they were, it was like the Harlem Globetrotters, and I almost expected I McDavid to make say. make a pass and then have the pass go out and then snap back onto his stick because it was attached to a rubber band. Like that's the kind of trick I thought we might see because they were just that loosey goosey and arrogant at the same time toying with the other team. My God, Bruce! Like if this power play is going to be like this all year, I don't know. Like it's that is just going to be something special. I was just going to say Harlem Globetrotters. You read my mind because I was, you know, just uh, the, like you say, almost arrogance and the, and the knowledge that they were, you know, going to put the biscuit in the basket. That's the Globetrotters always seem to do also. <laughs> yes. And you know that power play. Uh, I'm just looking at the. I'm just looking at the play by play now. The penalty was at 6:24. Uh, the orders generated a real good shot chase on at 6:43. A shot attempt. By Drysaddle at 7:04, a shot attempt by Nugent Hopkins at 7:15, a shot attempt by Drysaddle at 7:24, a shot attempt by Barry at 7:33, finally the goal by McDavid at 7:48. Like every 10 seconds, another shot towards the net, and even if it didn't get through, they always won the possession back. Like they just kept dominating the the puck recovery, and Vancouver never did clear the zone once on that entire power play, and eventually their penalty killers were just gassed. And it just seemed inevitable that someone was going to put it home or the goalie was going to somehow freeze it, you know. And uh, uh, fortunately, that was the one where Dreisaitl hit the post and it was actually the rebound that got tapped home. So really, they should credit two shot attempts on that one. But uh, it was uh, it was just domination and and just total control. And that, on that list that I just read to you, all five guys on the power play each had the sh- had a shot at at least one shot attempt. So yeah. they were really moving the puck around. And when they got in position to let fly, they did. Fantastic. Well, these guys have played together, except for Barry eh? and maybe mm-hmm. Chase on, but the three main players, Nuge, McDavid, and Drysaddle, have played together this is at least three years where, where they've been the mainstays. I can't remember what year it was that Nuge got moved there onto the uh, left half First wall unit. to stay. Mm-hmm. But they've, been, they've had a lot, a lot of time now Maybe not as much time as they should because of the refs not giving anyway, not penalties to the other team. But um, yeah, they are very. They know each other, and they're they're. You have to imagine they are having fun because they are just <laughs> they are so loosey goosey. And the the one thing like when they're out there a little long, uh, I find that they start to settle for a, an outside shot. They get a little right. tired, yep. and and so you know. I'm, but on the other hand, they're still probably better than the second unit. Um, 
uh, just hanging out there for the full two minutes. I, I expect to see they're going to be out there a long time for almost every power play all season long. So, your bad thing, Bruce. They pretty much dominated it um, tonight. I think they got almost all of the almost all of the power play time in the game. Yeah, was the uh, well, it was first unit they had. Uh, uh, yeah, the oil yeah, trotters. They, yeah, they had anyway. They uh, uh, they all you know logged major minutes, and all the other guys in the team had basically none. So yeah. they they scored on the first two power plays, and then their third one, they it started late because uh, the Oilers took a penalty, and then Vancouver took a matching penalty, and so they had a, had a late start to the power play, and they scored just after it ended that time. And they were just uh, just dominating. My bad thing, uh, it's not not much bad to say tonight. I'm 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 biting my tongue, whining about a couple of pretty chintzy calls that were made, and thinking that overall it's in Edmonton's best interest if the refs call a lot of penalties as opposed yeah. to a few, even if some of those calls are mighty chintzy, like the the holding penalty Cassian took, or the one McDavid where he had two hands on a stick. And he just dominated the guy with the shaft of his stick, and somehow that was holding. Anyway, that's not my bad thing. My I bad thing you were biting your tongue on that. The absence <laughs> of Mike Smith is my bad thing. Okay. And I'm not sure what the reason was, but he's right out of the lineup. No, um, you know, Stuart Skinner activated from the uh, uh, from the um, taxi squad on emergency basis. Uh, uh, Koskinen had to go in and play second game in a row. And to his credit, Koskinen responded very well indeed with a very, what they called a quiet game in between the pipes and, and some very nice saves and really no bad goals. I mean, he only led in two. And uh, he didn't see the one through the quadruple screen. And uh, he uh, uh, he delivered, but not sure what happened to Mike Smith. And some, I'd been interested to see this game. I thought, I wasn't interested to hear Mike Smith playing goal in an empty arena uh, on a team that clearly needed better organization tonight than they had last night. And I thought he might be barking orders out there, and that might be the sort of thing that you'd actually <clears throat> get more of because of the empty barn. But in the end, we didn't get to see Mike Smith, and some people would be happy about that. Um, but whether it's a positive test or some kind of a family matter, I've heard sort of conflicting uh, conflicting things. Either way, we wish him well, and uh, I want to see that new mask, man. Bruce, I was relieved, like, because because when we heard Skinner was gonna play oh, as an emergency, boy. I was thinking, is Co- I was thinking, is Koskinen hurt? Mm-hmm. And that was a, not a happy moment because I think Koskinen's a significantly better goalie than Smith at this point. He's the number one. Yeah. So uh, anyway, not um, I was I was relieved to see, uh, you know, it wasn't Koskinen because not that I'm happy that Mike Smith's out. I think he's. Right. I'd rather you know they need a backup. Now, the good mm-hmm. news is, Bruce, that Anton Forsberry has been yes. put on waivers so uh, by Carolina. So maybe the Oilers are going to get him back tomorrow, which would be... I was feeling a whole lot better about the Oilers' goalie situation uh, when he was on the roster because Stuart Skinner um, needs... Obviously, it's just not even a question. He needs more time in the AHL. Mm-hmm. And I think in, if they don't get Forsberry on the waiver wire tomorrow... It's gonna and Smith's out. It's gonna force their hand. They're gonna have to do something right away, because I guess. I, but I guess they could play Koskin in Saturday and then again on Monday, right? Like that would yeah. be a day's rest between games. He's gonna get a day's rest tomorrow. So I expect. Well, we'll see what happens with Smith, but that's probably what we're gonna see in the in the short term. But it would be good to get this get Forsberry back because um, I think he would be an adequate backup goalie and and adic- You could you could have him play some games and he's not you know. We haven't seen him yet, but his stats aren't terrible. Yeah, well, they got another back-to-back coming up at the end of the month. Before then, they play every other day. So, I mean, ideally, you don't want your goalie playing all of those games, but uh, maybe he needs one day off in in there somewhere. But uh, Forsberg, I think there's a pretty much a hundred percent chance that the Oilers are going to put in a claim on the guy and try and claim him back. And the deal is, if they're the only team that puts in a claim meaning that one NHL team waived him and none of the others made a claim that effectively the Oilers have then waived him and they can put him on their taxi squad, which is where they want him. On the other hand, if Smith is out, they actually do want him on their active roster. So that actually, in a sense, simplifies the matter. But you'd rather have that guy, a little more experienced guy, 
uh, than the than the true youngster, you know, is still developing his game uh, as the uh, backup tender. So that's something to watch for 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and see uh, see what happens. But there's a pretty good chance Edmonton will get their uh, their number three goalie back. Yeah, there was some rumor mongering, which I was a part of on the internet, <laughs> just speculation that mm. they maybe they'll uh, Holland would try to sign his old Detroit goalie Jimmy Howard. Yep. Um, who is a little younger than Smith and had a bad year last year, but is closer to a good year uh, than, than than Mike Smith. So well, it wouldn't be, I, I don't know if that's in the cards or not, but it's... He had a bad year on a terrible Well, team. that's it. Ter- so g- it's hard g- to ghastly. know how much of that is on the... Yeah, like they were one of the worst teams of the century, really. So it was... Uh, Hard to really tell how much of that was goaltending. The fact they didn't have good goaltending was a big part of the reason they were ghastly, I think. But but it wasn't just because of the goaltending. It was uh, it was a bad team. One of the worst teams of this or any century, the NHL. Uh, my bad thing, Bruce. I'm still not digging the fourth line. Uh, Kara actually had some moments mm-hmm. this game. Played but they were way out better for, tonight. He did. They were out for another goal against. Yep. And um, they looked terrible on that goal against. They were all running around. Mm-hmm. And they managed to have on that play four guys <laughs> screening Koskinen from the point, on the point shot. All the orders and, and, and a line. It was, and, and it was terrible because, <laughs> like, um, Chase on had chased the guy into the corner. And then the puck went back to the point, And the closest guy to the appointment was Larson. But Larson, of course, being the stay-at-home defenseman, he he should have probably just gone out to the point to cover off that shot. But it it, it just gave the guy all kinds of time to tee it up, and he and he did so and moved. It was who was it? That Nate shot Schmidt. That? Nate yeah, Schmidt. Nate Schmidt. And it's four fun. Oilers, four Oilers were in the line of fire, which is good. Maybe they were all trying to block the shot. I don't. Mm-hmm. I, I assume so. But they all screened Koskinen, and some like, some people were blaming Koskinen for not saving that one, Bruce. Um, what's your take on that? I I, I thought. That's a pretty hard It was shot. a rocket. No, I, I don't think there's any way he saw it. So it either hits him or it doesn't, right? Yeah. And Maybe he it, should have been it, in position. It seemed to have, well, he was in not bad position. It did seem to drop like Louie thought that it might have caught a stick out uh, partway in. Possibly an Oilers stick since it was all Oilers that were in the line of fire. And it seemed to drop. And But... I saw no definitive angle that showed a deflection. Usually you can tell, but... So not one grade A chance for that fourth line. Yeah. And Bruce, they've, they've got... I just hope when they when um, Haas is healthy, I'd like to see a fourth line of Negard, Haas, and, and Chase on. Mm-hmm. Or, or Ennis, Haas, and Chase on. Um, I, I think that would uh, that would do it. Um, I On that said, I mean, Kara, Jujar Kara did play okay on the... PK like he he's good there like he he's a big guy but I think I, I've floated this before Pulley Pulley RV could play the PK I think mm-hmm. big guy like that with lots of wingspan uh, would get him in the game more and um, I'd like to see that I think he could do as well as uh, JJ Carrick is doing at it if he was if Kara wasn't in the lineup here's a number for you this isn't my number but this is to do with your point fourth line uh, newcomer Devin Shore played seven minutes and four seconds, during which time uh, the Oilers attempted three shots in Vancouver, 15. And the shots on net were six to one against. So that's the second night in a row that the fourth line has been been owned, basically, in five on five play and given a goal each game, which is just not satisfactory. You know, you've got to, if you're going to play G-guard. five to seven minutes a night, you've got to find a way to saw off those minutes. Yeah. Play Joachim Nygaard with with Devin Shore at center and and maybe Chase on maybe that's the combination but change it up because that's terrible and uh, it's time to well, time to now mix that's the said, shot attempts and you know uh, the the orders blocked seven of those fifteen shots on on his watch like they really were selling out and and uh, getting in the way of things which is going to be my number which is next go ahead right? what is your yeah. number my number is twenty uh, twenty nine. Which is the number of blocked shots by the Edmonton Oilers in this game to just 10 by Vancouver Canucks. Uh, the Oilers also in the sort of physical part of the game, 37 hits to 24. But let's focus on the blocked shots. Six for Adam Larson, five for Slater Cuckoo. 
three for Kyle Turris to lead the forwards. And just a bunch of them by various players on the team. And this was actually, uh, um, uh, I liked this about the game, was that whoever was in the line of fire was prepared to sell out and take one. And, and a few guys, Kukuk took a wicked blast. Caleb Jones took a wicked blast. Uh, a couple of fours, I mean, Josh Archibald made a f- fabulous sliding block of a dangerous blast. And uh, it was... Uh, uh, just um, an indicator. It's one of those 200 hockey men indicators of your team just leaving it out there and, you know, bringing what they had and, and, and giving what they needed to give to win the game. And to me, in that sense, you know, block shot sometimes tells you a little bit about the temperature of the game. And this is without Chris Russell blocking any shots. Let's let's remember that. So this is uh, all the guys he taught. <laughs> Bruce, in honor of the 200, uh, 200 hockey man, I should my number should be thirteen tonight. Uh, <laughs> yes, a pulley he or ninety eight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's a funny issue. It just makes some people oh. crazy. That some people like it's it's a funny issue on both sides. Is all I'll say about it. Like, yeah. I don't I don't I don't I don't have any any care about what number he wears at all myself. But it's really upset some people that. That uh, mm-hmm. that Maddie and Speck would be uh, criticizing him for having number ninety eight, and then it also upsets the old time the two hundred hockey men that Pulleyarvi would take ninety eight. So it's just a funny. I just think that's a funny issue. Uh, Bruce, my number is uh, uh, I'll go with eleven and eight. Those were the grade A chances, major contributions to grade A scoring chances from Connor McDavid and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And if those guys are going to play on the same line, looks like that might. Like they're going to stick with that. Mm-hmm. They really do have to produce, and two ways. They got to be dominant, two-way hockey players in their own end and at the other end, and they were that game. And um, it was one of McDavid's magic nights as an offensive hockey player in the NHL, and uh, not a moment too soon for the <laughs> young season because fans mm-hmm. like me were panicking. <laughs> Just kidding. No, you you want to boss things, and and McDavid bossed things tonight. And I, generally, the Oilers did, but uh, McDavid certainly led the way in that department. But Nuge, as the other guy you named, I thought he was way better tonight. Yeah, uh, you know, last night, you know, he was in on some scoring chances, but it was like a couple of them were almost accidental, where the puck bounced to him, and he was able to chip yeah. it to a good spot or stuff. It wasn't like real uh, uh, strong. Uh, Planned plays, and tonight he was clicking with his mates on the power play, and certainly with McDavid and and Cassian at even strength. You know, because he's such a he just strikes me as such a humble uh, individual, and but he's got to play with some arrogance in his game. He's mm-hmm. got to get that going sure. to become a great offensive hockey player. And I think with McDavid, because McDavid is an arrogant player, right? He's cocky. Like after he scored that goal, you know, like uh, I think it was. Uh, yeah, it was the great goal that he scored. You know, like mm-hmm. his celebration afterwards was pretty good. Yeah. But New- that should rub off. I want to see that rub off on Nugent. I'm starting to see that. Like, just just play with a tremendous amount of confidence and and hustle. And maybe we will we will see that Normie Ullman uh, second phase, Patrick Marlowe second phase mm-hmm. of his career that you've talked about, where the player mm-hmm. gets better into his 30s uh, with Nugent Hopkins. We. He, this is, you know, that was a, one of the best games Nuge has ever played for the Edmonton Oilers. And if he's looking for a big payday, uh, that's a pretty good uh, statement game. Now, just put together uh, 20 or 30 more of those in a row and you have a midseason negotiation and you're all set. Well, here's a number for you and a statement because the numbers are the statement. In his last 36 games, dating back to New Year's Eve, so his last 36 games, Nugent Hopkins has 52 points. Wow, 52 points in 36 games. That's something very close to 120 per 82 pace. Just a little <laughs> bit off, maybe 118 or, or right in there yeah. per 82. Like that's not just point a game, but way, way above. I mean, 52 and 36. That's that's just phenomenal. I mean, and he's he's done that at left wing basically since he moved to the wing. With uh, dry saddle most of the last regular season with uh, McDavid in the play ends and again with McDavid now and he's just um, continued to pop him home and so yeah. that's 
But maybe the reason that they're a little bit far apart on the numbers is that the Oilers are seeing him as a complimentary player and the agent's going, well, my man had 49 points in the last 34 games last year and uh, let's see how he does in the first half of this year and talk again. And yeah, this is going. the problem that we've talked about before mm-hmm. with McNe- the, the longer you wait mm-hmm. when he's playing with McDavid and playing on that power play, the more you're going to pay because in the NHL, you pay for points. Mm-hmm. And... Um, He's getting them. Yeah, so well, that's, that's good, good news. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's treat that as good news. <laughs> of course, I always want the orders to play, sign players for as little as possible because mm-hmm. salary cap, because we're, you know, we're right. all playing GM now. And, but the salary cap really is a huge issue on every it, team. No, no, it's a legitimate competitive it thing is. that a player at one salary can help your team and the same player at a higher salary can actually be a hindrance on your team. You've got to find the right price point. Where the guy is, you know, providing value over and above what he's costing you out of your, you know, it's like playing a game of Monopoly. You start with fifteen hundred dollars, you know, do you spend that three hundred and twenty on Pennsylvania Avenue or do you not? You know, because you might want to spread your wealth elsewhere, elsewhere, and there's a finite amount of it. So, pro tip, Bruce, you you uh-huh. do buy Pennsylvania Avenue every yeah. single time. Yeah. <laughs> At least that's my strategy. All I right. used to ignore the greens and go for the blues, but that was my strategy. Park <laughs> Place and Boardwalk. <laughs> well, that's a funny game. Monopoly. We were playing Pente the other night. Mm-hmm, you ever played yeah. that? That was fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we talked about that. You had one of your daughters. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 I, I, I remember getting clobbered by this guy at, uh, on our oh, lunch Oh, that's, breaks. yeah, that's right. That's what you're telling me, the Pente tournament. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, Bruce. Thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, um, it's nice to nice to have a win again, man. It's our second win in ten months. You know, the Oilers came into this game having lost six out of their last seven, a streak that began in January, continued through August, and then continued. No, sorry, it began in March, continued through August. And it uh, continued with the first game in this January. And it seemed like a long, bloody time that we were waiting for a game with a happy result. So I'm I'm happy. I'm happy too. This is a good Oilers team, Bruce. This is a very good Oilers team. Uh, over the series, I'll just one last thing. They they outchanced the Canucks, I think, 1917. In our, after we reviewed it, that's what the scoring chances were, 1917 and 15-8. to eight. So that's not bad. All right, in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.